was your first play, Crack Walker, took you to the Tarragon? No. No. No, no. It was done at Theatre Pass Mirai. Yeah, and it started at, with actually Keith Turnbull before Theatre Pass Mirai. He had a theater. I can't remember the name of it now. He ran a NDWT. Yes. And Michael Mawson, who had been one of my teachers at NTS, and that's the greatest thing about theater school is just learn, learning to be on time and, and networking, connecting with people. And he and I was a mess, you know, I just wrote a big mess and handed it to him and he loved it and he, he tried to convince them to do it and they said it was far too dark, it's just, you know, horrible. Keith liked it and we had a reading which was, as a young theater st school graduate, it was like a thrill beyond thrills with professional actors at the Bathurst Street Theater. And already I was a pain in the ass to everybody going, no, no, do it like this, you know, <laughs> directing. And thus began my long career as a pain in the ass <laughs> to do directors. And, uh, and then finally Clark agreed to do it. And then um, it was like the battle royale between the two of us during rehearsal. And, uh, you know, he was a very troubled character, so very abusive uh, in the rehearsal hall and everything. But because uh, he was male, you were female. You I think were that younger, was a lot of it. I was young, yeah. And he, I, I'd laugh at one of my own lines. He'd say, "Get out of here." I mean, I was just honestly laughing because it was funny, and um, and then I'd get mad. I'd leave for two days because I knew he could not go a day. He couldn't go without me. I don't mean to sound, you know, but it's true, uh, because I needed to be there every second. And uh, anyway, it did turn out very well. And rest in peace. I I feel sad that how how his life ended and. Um, that he was so troubled, but thank you know, thank God they did it, and so that was there. Urjo had seen it, 50 seats, and I remember in the first week, you know, asking people in the alley, please come to my play, because nobody was this coming. This is Urjo Kureda, who is a, a critic at that point. He's he, not running uh, Tarragon. He's not. He, no, he was already running Tarragon. He was, and running he was Tarragon. a critic. He was asked <clears> then, which was quite amazing at Bill Glasgow, why don't you come and run the theater? You criticize it or you praise it, and. So he had seen it, and I was working on my next play, White Biting Dog, and he called me and said, what are you working on? And I remember we lived in a little attic apartment on Brunswick Avenue, and I remember the call, the moment. And because it's so thrilling at that age, every, I'm still like that. I'm just like so, it's like Christmas was, holiday. Um, and he said, what are you working on? Bring it to me. And he embraced the play, fully strange play that it is. <laughs> and, um, and he was dramaturge, a very gentle dramaturge. It was always very exciting to meet with him. He was so extraordinarily kind of witty and literate and, and... And was it his mind or his gut or his wit that was useful or was helpful? First his embrace, an absolute in encouragement. He gave me a, an office for life. He believed in me so much that I became complacent and that is not a good thing. I would say that complacency is our greatest enemy, and we are all fall prey to it, to praise or whatever. And um, you know, he should have, a couple plays of mine he shouldn't have done, but he did. They weren't ready, like Which like one? Sled. It just it was a mess. It was a huge big mess, but there are great things in it, and it reads well. It's been in a couple of anthologies, but it wasn't ready. And I wish I had someone just said, "No, sorry, you can cry all you like. It's not ready. I'd only be doing you a disservice." But I don't blame him. He felt I had to see that it wasn't ready. But don't spend all that money and waste everybody's time. So how did you and he then work on White Biting Dog? We, we'd just have meetings once every couple of weeks. And he'd have a bunch of beautifully, have beautiful handwriting of notes. And his notes always make sense. And he, he's famous for saying things like, where are the jokes? Although in that one, there were a lot of jokes. But, um, you know, and say things like when we were casting, say, well, you do need at least two attractive actors on stage. And, <laughs> silly, funny, bottom line things like that. Um, <laughs> yeah, and he was a great gossip. And uh, did he talk about structure? Did he talk about character? Did yeah, he talk about structure. He'd say, "Well, you know, you if you begin with this, you can't end here." He was actually very aware of the audience, and as you know, the audience loved him, and the donors loved him because he was unlike anybody else. He was a real Renaissance man. He uh, so learned. Uh, so young in some ways, so you know, wise and old in many ways, and young in many ways, in wonderful ways. And Terrified of flying and snakes. And who directed White Biting Dog? Bill, Bill Glasgow. How was that? Well, 
I, mean, I wanted I cannot him. think of two I know. And key he signatures said, palettes no, that are different. You are so right, because he said to me, I don't know why you would ask me to direct this, <laughs> but it's because I was still in my theater student worshipful okay. phase, and he was Bill Glasgow. And he's a very kind, paternal man, so that was helpful to me at the time. And we'd meet at his house on Robert Street, I think it was, and uh, just go over and over the script till he wanted to really understand it. And I think it was great with him because the production was really good. Did he ask for changes? Oh, Did yeah. Did he dramaturge? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I look at it now and I feel sort of distant, because you are a different person. We are the same but different, I guess. Because you know? mm. all those fearless moments sort of happen and, and you kind of become different. I think a lot of the, that play was in reaction to the Crackwalkers, because, oh, she can only write, you know, characters that come out under a rock and this and that. So and that a hyper kitchen sink. So I started trying to go the other way and sort of look at it now from a distance and think, oh, yeah, what is that? It's like a weird dream, fever dream or something. Um, but yeah, so Urjo gave me an office for life. He was there. I remember after the opening of Sled, just sitting across from him in a rest and just tears streaming down my face, like, what's happened? It's such a disaster. He said, you know, it could be the critics are right. <laughs> I just sort of started to stop. He went, no, no, they're not. They're not. <laughs> and uh, so maybe he thought that was a lesson I needed. Maybe he's right, you know. But 